happy Saturday, everybody. One of our episodes this week was on the swill milk scandal. And so we thought for our Saturday classic today, we would stick with this theme of adulterated food. This episode is from previous hosts, Sarah and Dublina, and it came out on May 11th of 2011. It's on chemist Harvey Washington Wiley, who studied effects of food additives on human volunteers who became known as the Poison Squad. His work eventually contributed to the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, and he continued to campaign against food adulteration afterward. So overall, at least in my opinion, this episode is not quite as gross as some of the things that we talked about in the Swill Milk episode, but it does cover the physical effects of eating things like borax, We've also had various listener requests to do an episode on the Poison Squad. So for those folks, particularly enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Dublina Chakraborty. And I'm Sarah Dowdy. And when you walk into the grocery store these days, there's a lot of things to kind of worry about, I guess. I mean, should you buy organic? Should you buy foods that are grass-fed, cage-free? Is what you're looking at locally grown? Just to name a few problems you might face. Well, because there's pretty serious health-related food concerns, too, like mercury levels in fish and bacterial contamination. You know, there was that news recently that half of all the meat sold in the United States is tainted with drug-resistant staff. Yeah, that freaked scary. me out. Apparently, some people aren't very concerned about it. I, I don't know. I, I guess that's a big statistic, but it sounds weird. And still, you know, we have the salmonella egg recall a few years ago. There was the peanut butter scare. Oh, yeah, when you couldn't eat certain granola bars. I remember my mom calling me up about that, like, don't eat any granola bars. <laughs> they might have peanut butter. Bars. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we have a lot to think about. Yeah. So it's not a perfect system right now as far as food regulation goes, but it still seems to have come a long way from what it was about 100 years ago in the U.S. when there were really no labeling requirements, no safety tests, and no one really monitored additives. Those substances like borax, which is actually used in detergent and things like that, and formaldehyde, um, and these were used as food preservatives at the time. I know formaldehyde in your food sounds pretty ridiculous if you've ever done like a dissection in biology class or something and smelled the stuff. But that's when the chemist Harvey W. Wiley came into the picture because obviously if you have stuff like borax and formaldehyde in your food, Things need work. Yeah, so Wiley stepped in, first mainly trying to change things solely through legislation and then through something that came to be known as the Poison Squad. And that was a kind of human experiment through which Wiley tested substances used in food that he believed to be harmful. And this became kind of a media sensation. It got a lot of attention. Yeah, as it would. So we're going to take a look at how the Poison Squad worked and what it accomplished and also why Wiley is considered by many to be the founding father of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Yeah, but first we're going to give a little background on Wiley. He's kind of a pioneer man almost. He was born in 1844 in a log cabin on a frontier farm in Indiana, so real classic beginnings. And in addition to being a father, his father was a Campbellite preacher. So Wiley grew up in this real evangelical background with a strong emphasis on doing the right thing, which is clearly going to come into play in his later career. Yeah, but before that career took off, he went to Hanover College in Indiana in the 1860s. He dropped out briefly in 1864 to serve in the Union Army during the Civil War, but he never really saw combat. So he returned to finish up at Hanover and then went on to get a medical degree at Indiana Medical College, and he studied medical science for a year at Harvard. So very educated. Yeah, and from there he got a professorship in chemistry at Purdue University. And it's while he was there that he helped write a report for the Indiana State Board of Health condemning adulterated foods. And his main thoughts and main research had to do with honey. And he found basically that companies were adulterating honey, passing it off as pure honey, but really adding glucose. In fact, 
the product they were selling was mostly glucose, and he was pretty disturbed by this. So this is the first time he caused a little bit of a controversy, but it was not the last time. No, this experience is what caused the interest in food adulteration that Wiley would have throughout his entire career and his life. In 1883, he actually got a chance to take that interest to the national level when he was offered the position of chief chemist in the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And this came at a good time, too, because he had some trouble with the administration at Purdue around that time. Time to make an exit. Yeah, exactly. I think it was something about riding a bike on campus and that he didn't think that was like fitting for a professor. Oh, yeah. How scandalous. (laughs) Definitely. So his main job as the chief chemist was to support new agricultural industries because this was, after all, a government job. That's the kind of thing that he'd be expected to do. But he still followed his own passion and developed this test for food purity on the side, something um, so he could look at what people were really putting into food. Yeah, and eventually he took his fight for federal food regulation to Congress. His work contributed to several pure food bills in the 1880s and the 1890s. So this is what we're referring to when we talked about legislation that he contributed to. But none of these bills, they none of them went anywhere. They yeah. all kind of failed. So something had to be done, though. I mean, adulteration of food was a real problem. There were instances of sanded sugar, watered milk, sawdust-enhanced flour, which just sounds crazy just to name a few things that were problems at the time. And some states had laws against these things, but with the growth of nationwide food distribution, it was really hard to enforce them once they crossed state lines. Yeah, so people didn't know where their food was even coming from. And according to an article by Bernard A. Weisberger in American Heritage, late 19th century technology brought more additives into the picture, too. So it wasn't just these things being added like sugar or watered milk. It was coloring agents and preservatives like copper sulfate and flour bleaches and Wiley's first big concern that we mentioned earlier, borax. Yeah, so since manufacturers weren't required to prove preservative safety, Wiley asked Congress in 1899 for money to do the tests himself. He wanted to learn, quote, whether preservatives should ever be used or not, and if so, what preservatives and in what quantities. So he thought if he could prove that these substances were harmful, that Congress and the public would finally support national regulation policies. So that was the goal here. Third-party testing, essentially. So in 1902, Congress gave Wiley funding to start these tests that he wanted to do, and they were known officially as the Hygienic Table Trials. And the way they worked is kind of medieval-seeming almost. It reminds me of the king's food tester. Yeah, it's really interesting, actually. Wiley recruited 12 young, healthy men. They were all volunteers, actually, from the Department of Agriculture. Let's hope so. Yeah. (laughs) They weren't tricked in any way. They were all in their 20s, though, and that was so they'd be sturdy enough for the experiment, or so Wiley determined. And for a span of six months, those 12 men agreed to eat only meals that were prepared in a test kitchen that Wiley set up in the basement of the Agriculture Department building. Yeah, but here's the catch. Each meal would include one suspect ingredient that Wiley wanted to test. So, (laughs) for example, the borax. Yeah, that's going to make you question this free meal deal a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Sounds good up until that point. But another aspect of it was that the men also pledged to eat all their meals at the hygienic table. And that was that meant that they were eating at a dining table in a dining room that was set up next to the test kitchen. So this was all in the basement together. I'm thinking this is the counterpart to NPR's splendid table. (laughs) Yeah, not very pleasant, though. So they agreed that they would not consume any outside foods or beverages, too, except for water. And even that had to be measured and reported. I mean, the deal was they didn't want to get sick from something the guy was snacking on on the side. Exactly. And each participant had to record his weight, temperature, and pulse before each meal and what he ate. They also had to submit urine and feces samples daily. So not definitely gross all around. Very (laughs) gross. But I would say that's probably the 
most unpleasant aspect of the daily ritual. Yeah, and then also doctors would examine the participants and note any symptoms in case these additives were having negative effects. Yeah, on a weekly basis, right? So all the volunteers obviously knew that they were eating potential poisons, but they all signed to these waivers that absolved the government from any liability in case they got ill. And so initially, Wiley's approach was to make it pretty random, to mix the potential poison, whatever the poison of the week was into the food, uh, which was supposed to be pretty good, too. I mean, I guess that's why they got these volunteers in the first place. Yeah, I've seen different examples mentioned, roast chicken, braised beef, buttered asparagus. So And a little borax on the side. <laughs> yeah, well, if you forget about the borax, it sounds like a decent deal. But even though the men weren't told which food item Wiley put the substance such as borax in, they ended up avoiding that particular item in the first couple of trials. So It would taste funny. Yeah. For example, if Wiley put borax in the butter, they wouldn't eat it because they would notice it. I'm not sure how different that how different the taste would be, but... Yeah, you would realize, oh, that's where the poison is and move on to your roast chicken and asparagus meal. Yeah, so then what Wiley did pretty early in the trial is he changed his approach. He started putting the preservatives in these gelatin capsules instead. And this meant that the poison was no longer hidden, but surprisingly really surprisingly to me, the men took them willingly. Wiley put them out in a serving bowl with each meal with the understanding that if they were taken in the middle of the meal, they would dissolve in the digested food. So it would be pretty much the same as eating it actually mixed in with a food item. Yeah. And another interesting point, Wiley didn't make the guinea pigs take all the risk. He took, he joined in for many of the meals too. Imagine that endeared him to the 12 volunteers a little bit. So Obviously, these hygienic table trials become a national sensation pretty quickly, and the newspapers think of, it, of an even better name for the whole thing and dub the volunteer test subjects the poison squad. And the experiment really did have a show-like quality to it. The volunteers even had their own slogan. It was, none but the brave can eat the fair, and people even wrote songs about them. Yeah, one was called The Song of the Poison Squad, and it was by the Lou Dockstader Minstrels. I hope I said that right. Yeah, all you Lou Dockstader fans out there can let us know. I yeah, guess. write in and tell me if I said that correctly. But the song went like this, or uh, this was one verse. Oh, they may get over it, but they'll never look the same. That kind of bill of fare would drive most men insane. Next week, he'll give them mothballs a la Newberg or else plain. Oh, they may get over it, but they'll never look the same. Yeah, so pretty catchy there. I like to think they might have played that at the dinner table or something. But some people obviously put a humorous spin on this whole thing. And the experiment even made its way into variety acts of the time, um, probably understandably so, because research at the dinner table didn't really seem that sciencey. It seemed kind of fun. Well, not that fun, I guess, but different at least. Yeah, compared to most traditional scientific studies. It's not a lab coat kind of situation. Yeah. I mean, you could. I could imagine this being like a reality show, couldn't you? I mean, I think it is a reality show. Yeah, pretty like a, much. a cross between Fear Factor and Top Chef or something. Yeah. So you can imagine a million people wanting to tune in, so to speak, and see what's happening every week with these guys. And Wiley did worry about this at first because he wanted to take the research seriously, but he still knew that he needed to win over the public and get them involved. That's the point of the whole thing. So he worked the banquet circuit, even making up little poems for listeners like this one entitled, I Wonder What's In It. And it goes... The pepper perhaps contains coconut shells, and the mustard is cottonseed meal. The coffee in sooth of baked chicory smells, and the terrapin tastes like roast veal. Yeah, and he also started talking to reporters, too, about the experiment. So not just writing these catchy little poems, but giving them every detail of the effects that the poisons had on the men. And some of the examples of the effects were disturbing. I mean, borax proved to be not so bad. Perhaps it gave the men a little bit of indigestion. But over the long term and in increased amounts, it caused weight loss and reproductive system damage. So definitely some problems with a frequent food additive there. Formaldehyde was tested later, and Wiley had to end those tests pretty much right off the bat because the men got so sick they couldn't even get out of bed. 
So, you know, that's good stuff for the news. Yeah, there's definitely some scare factor there. But the experiment went on for five years with different groups of volunteers, and eventually that publicity that they got definitely paid off. The public's growing awareness put pressure on the government, and on June 30th, 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt signed the Pure Food and Drugs Act, which was largely written by Wiley, and it was the nation's first law regulating food and pharmaceutical manufacturing. Many called it the Wiley Act, not surprisingly. Appropriately enough. And Wiley got a a new job out of it, too. Yeah, he got to oversee this new act's administration. And that's kind of why he's known as the father of the Pure Food and Drug Act, as you might imagine. Yeah, but things were still a little bit rough for him after this big triumph, even. He had a lot of adversaries in Congress, and he met with a lot of opposition while trying to enforce the act because, you know, an act in the books is only— as good as its enforcement. So he even butted heads with the president and the secretary of agriculture and ended up resigning in 1912. Yeah, but it wasn't so bad for his career because he ended up moving on to another really high profile position. He signed on as the director of the Bureau of Foods, Sanitation and Health for Good Housekeeping magazine. And the magazine at that point had already created the Good Housekeeping Institute laboratories to ensure the reliability of things that it featured in the magazine on its pages. So Wiley added his own lab in D.C. to the mix and continued his fight for pure food in that way. Yeah, and he worked there for another 19 years as the director before he died in 1930 at the ripe old age of 86. So I guess some of those additives didn't have too bad of an effect on him for the long term. But during those years, he led the fight for tougher government inspection of meat and for pure butter that was unadulterated with water and for whole wheat flour, among a lot of other things. And interestingly, that good housekeeping test an approved seal also became a real symbol of responsible industry of safe food. And it still probably means something to consumers today, I'd say. Yeah, for sure. And Wiley's accomplishment is felt in other ways, too. Borax, salicylic acid, formaldehyde, and copper sulfate, all of these things are long gone from the food additive market. Fortunately. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. And that Pure Food and Drug Act that Wiley championed, that led to the more famous 1938 Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act. So big changes. Big changes, definitely. Um, And as for former members of the Poison Squad, no official follow-up was done on how they did in later years, but anecdotal evidence showed that at least some of them did okay. One, for example, a guy named William O. Robinson lived to be 94. So there you go. It didn't turn out (laughs) so badly for everyone. Yeah, I like to imagine maybe Poison Squad was on their business cards or something after the fact. Oh, yeah, I would wear that Go into the restaurant business or something. (laughs) I don't know. I think you'd always be suspicious, though, if you went into the restaurant business. (laughs) I would be. I'm suspicious now after reading this. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 